So I am a professor Gui Hui of the of the strategy department, and I have the pleasure you know, to uh, to meet with Professor Steve Kaslowski from Michigan State University. Professor Kaslowski is uh, is a known expert uh, on team leadership. Today, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of his research on dynamic team leadership. So we are very intrigued to, to know what is dynamic team leadership and why should companies care about that? Well, I think it, it's helpful to understand leadership theory in, in a little bit of a broader context, or at least why I'm interested in dynamic leadership in the broader context of leadership theory. And much of the leadership theory that gets taught in organizational behavior and management is what I would call generic. And in that sense, it's about the structural characteristics. What is it that leaders do that helps them be effective as leaders? And those structural characteristics tend to be very fixed or static. So there are theories and, and there are measurement tools and there are consulting systems that go out and try to assess what those characteristics are and then attempt to train leaders to exhibit those characteristics. But what it doesn't do is take account of whether there are contingencies or circumstances that might dictate when certain characteristics are more appropriate than others. So we end up with what I would call a fixed or a generic static kind of notion of leadership that gets taught to leaders at all levels, right, to be used all times for all problems. Can you give some examples of what a structural characteristic is versus a contingency characteristic? Okay, so um, a popular theory of leadership is uh, transformational leadership. And there are a number of dimensions or characteristics that leaders who are very good at this um, transformational leadership might exhibit, that their subordinates could see and report on a questionnaire. And that's how we would assess whether someone is a transformational leader or is a, uh, what do they call it, sort of a laissez-faire negotiating kind of a, a leader, um, more of a, an instrumental or exchange leader. And those would be things like um, being able to intellectually stimulate one's followers, having a, a vision, uh, being able to exhibit some charisma versus leaders who are, in a, in, a, in a sense, kind of identifying goals and providing rewards, or maybe doing nothing except stepping in when there are problems. And it's not that that is anything like wrong with those kind of theories, but they simply provide a one-size-fits-all solution to leadership. And my view on leadership is that, particularly if you want to understand it in more mm, complicated or intense situations, uh, I study something called action teams, I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a moment. You really need to understand how leadership needs to change in order to fit the requirements of the situation. So the, the basic idea of dynamic theory of team leadership is understanding what those factors are in a, a team environment, an action team environment, and then uh, uh, identifying what it is a leader needs to do to shape the development and capabilities of the team, and then essentially be able to push team members along so that they develop the skills to be adaptive and essentially to be able to self-manage, which frees the leader up to do other kinds of things that can help the team in the long run. So what that does is in, in, in sort of juxtaposition of what I would call the mainstream or generic kinds of theories, it means focusing on what those dynamic characteristics are. And uh, in a team context, so we're not thinking so much about the top of an organization, but really more in the, the middle where things get done, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. It's about leaders being able to develop specific skill sets among their subordinates. And that means really being able to identify what skills people need to develop and being able to push them along in, a, in what I would call a phased developmental process. So the skills for the leader it, it means that the leader has to be able to identify what's an appropriate goal to set for development, um, to be able to create or harness opportunities where one might be able to have an experience where uh, the skills that underlie accomplishment of that goal could be expressed. The leader can monitor those behaviors uh, across team members, uh, be able to identify where there might be some deficiencies with respect to the desired level of skill development, and then be able to as a team has engaged in some activity and now has a, an opportunity to reflect on how things went, be able to guide members to um, uh, in process feedback, un understand what things may have happened, uh, what was good, what was maybe not so good, and how might the team improve its, its capabilities in a subsequent experience. So it really means thinking about the tasks that teams perform and the role of the leader in being able to harness that experience 
create opportunities for people to learn mm -hmm. and, and, and crystallize that learning. And then in the longer term, be able to develop members across successive skill sets. You know, what's important to, uh, in terms of being a, an effective team member and accepting the mission of the team, skill proficiency, being able to work effectively with others, and then essentially being able to, as a team, adapt and perform uh, effectively so that the leader can do more of the boundary management. How do we interface with other teams in the organization? How do we uh, accomplish the, the broader missions, if you will? Is that, is that the task of a single leader for a team? Or is it possible that uh, that the process of team development can be uh, shared by many leaders at different, different times? Or it could be by various members? How, how do you see it? The theory that I work from and the research that I do is really focused not so much at the top of the organization, but as I say, more in, in, in what I would call the middle, where supervisors or leaders are operating with small groups. They could be face-to-face, -face, they could be virtual. But they're small, task-performing groups where things have to get accomplished. and it requires, that is this theory requires, or, 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 or for this to happen, that the leader be fairly proficient in terms of being able to perform that task as well as to have the, the skills and capabilities that allow them to um, harness this learning process as well as to develop team members. So it's not so much what I see as top management team kind of skill, but it's the kind of skill that permeates many levels and sectors of the organization where work is getting done. So, so the way I see it is that team leadership is much more patient, gradual process, it, it developmental process, more than a one-size-fits-all. That's right. It's not a directive process so much. It's really much more of a learning process. And, a parenting and the, process. Almost. Exactly. And, the, mm -hmm. and the, the, the goal is to really build the capabilities of members so that the team can effectively self-manage. Mm -hmm. And the leader can do things such as uh, gain resources, minimize conflicts, um, essentially enable the team to pursue its, its mission broadly within the organization. So have you seen any kind of teams op operating along you know, the model that you are suggesting? Well, in order to do research, one, one tries to look for opportunities where, um, that are extreme to some extent, right? So you can observe uh, the characteristics that are of interest. So the kinds of teams that uh, have served as sort of the research um, focus would be teams that do um, critical actions, high reliability teams. So that would be uh, healthcare teams. I'm doing work with emergency medical physicians where um, you might be a trauma patient, you're wheeled into a, a room, four people come in, four physicians, and right away they have to figure out what's happened, what's wrong, how are we gonna solve the patient's problem. So things are happening very quickly and the consequences of an error are not very good. Right, so that's a situation that we might look at. Or I also do some work with the, uh, with the Air Force and the Navy. Mm -hmm. And again, they have teams that have to perform critical functions. Um, there isn't a lot of latitude to make mistakes. And so it's very important that in these high reliability situations, team members can effectively integrate mm -hmm. their capabilities and accomplish the goal. And that puts that premium on team leadership to make sure that they have those capabilities mm -hmm. when that situation demands flexible, adaptive performance. Not all the team members have equal competencies or capabilities. They to tend to be that. specialized. And, and they so, need to be developed. Right. And so the part of the role of the leader is really to help, not just to build those capabilities, but to help the team members integrate those, those capabilities that they have. And I know I picked some extreme examples, but um, it's not too far-fetched to find more uh, it could be uh, software company, you know, software projects, uh, complex software you projects. You have time pressure, you have mm -hmm. distributed or different kinds of experts that have to fit together. You can have crisis management teams in, in a variety of technical mm -hmm. functions. Uh, I know, for example, there are uh, network-based or computer system companies that have to manage network traffic that, that have to deal with crises and such. So it, it permeates a variety of organizations. But it's not your everyday kind of you know, team. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much.